Okay, just. Thank you for okay. everyone that uh, came to this uh, uh, conference given by Marco Ferran. This, uh, the research that uh, Marco will present is a uh, part of a, a project funded by Azorian government, FEDER, that aims to study the uh, ecos uh, ecosystem services in Azorian agro uh, ecosystems and uh, is a very ambitious project that aims also to quantify if possible uh, some disservices in different habitats that include uh, maize fields, uh, orchards, uh, vineyards, um, citrus orchards, vineyards, uh, and also native forests as a control habitat. Uh, during the last two years, uh, Marco, as uh, the main researcher contracted to this project, is conducting very important uh, standardized quantification of both ecosystem services and the services in these habitats. And is also one of the first approaches in this, uh, we, using these uh, standardized uh, quantification of ecosystem services in island ecosystems. I think the Marco presentation will be very uh, interesting and uh, Mark is presenting uh, a small fraction of the work uh, so far conducted, but I think will be very valuable for uh, the people that is now with us and hopefully in near future we will have a more complete overview of all the research so far conducted. Marco, I give you the floor. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you for the presentation. I'm going to share my screen. Um, can you see? Yes, yes, Marco. It's fine. All right. Let me move this part here. Um, I think that generally uh, questions are at the end of the presentation, but uh, feel free to, to stop me whenever if you want to ask uh, something or if you have any comment, if you want to add uh, anything, why not? Uh, there is absolutely no problem with that. Um, as Paolo mentioned, we are going to talk about scavenging, um, a very understudy uh, ecosystem services compared to uh, other such as pollination and uh, pest control. Uh, before, oh, sorry. Uh, but that will be only the last part of the presentation, will be the main core of the presentation. The experiment we have done here on the Tercera Island and the Azores to, to measure scavenging. Before that, I wanted to give you a little bit of context. And um, I was thinking to start by uh, somehow refreshing uh, the definition of ecosystem function because scavenging is uh, an ecosystem function. And, uh, and also talking a little bit about the, the relationship between biodiversity and ecosystem functioning, which is uh, a very uh, topical um, argument, uh, um, problem, let's say, of, uh, of ecology. And uh, Paolo already mentioned very briefly the, um, the project, the agroservices. Um, I will also uh, show you a few slides um, explaining uh, uh, the other quantifications that we have done. Um, Probably most of you already uh, know what's the experiment or what the project is about because I uh, presented uh, the c 3 c meeting uh, last week and also the previous year at another c 3 meeting. So maybe not completely new for all of you, but it will be um, pretty fast just to explain the the rationale of this uh, of this project. So. No hesitation, let's start with the definition of ecosystem function. Let's try to um, understand what we mean when we talk about uh, uh, functions. Um, you know that every organism essentially perform uh, um, activities in, uh, in, in ecosystem. I mean, from, uh, from their perspective, they do activities for survival, right? They, they consume plants, they 
they feed uh, by pollinating uh, or, or um, they predate on other species. So they um, they just do activity for for living, for reproduction and uh, and uh, uh, survival. Uh, when you look at this from uh, uh, an ecosystem perspective, you, you get ecosystem function because essentially all this activity that uh, uh, organisms uh, perform, they, they are also useful to, to translocate energy or, or even uh, material within ecosystem. No? They uh, move uh, um, energy between trophic levels or material within the same trophic level. Um, and this is, uh, uh, this is a concept that can be understood only if we look at, this, uh, um, at these interactions from uh, an ecosystem perspective. And when I talk about ecosystem, I, uh, I mean this, the concept that integrate uh, the biotic community with the physical uh, environment where the biotic community is located. So this is a, um, an old concept, it date to... 1935, it was first reformulated by the plant ecologist Townsley. Um, so in this presentation, we are going to talk about the ecosystem function. Uh, however, sometimes this, this term is uh, confused with ecosystem services. So we also have to, to make a clarification about uh, between these two. Um, so the, the reason why I think uh, people often confuse ecosystem function and ecosystem services is that they are both provided by, by biodiversity. Biodiversity essentially is uh, what, from an ecosystem perspective, can be called the structure, the, the, the base that provides uh, this interaction, this activity and this uh, regulation of, of ecosystem, which is the ecosystem function level. Now, if you look at this function from an anthropic perspective, from a very utilitarian perspective about benefits that uh, people may obtain, um, these are often called ecosystem services, but sometimes people refer to them like the nature's contribution to, to people, right? So it's a, it's a concept that uh, basically is centered on, uh, on, on societies, on, on the human being. And uh, not all ecosystem function will uh, will uh, provide, will turn on, and will translate into into ecosystem services, but many do. And if you think, for instance, about uh, pollination, that's all often uh, considered a service. It, it, although you know, it may also consider a disservice if you think about, the, for instance, the the pollination of a weed or the pollination of an invasive plants. You know this. It's a, it's a function that may uh, be positive or negative from a, an anthropic perspective based on the final outcome. Uh, you know, if it supports a, a, a crop, for instance, then it's a, it's a service. If you support an invasive species and help it to spread, it's a, it's a disservice. So uh, here I put some photos of spiders to, to, to make a, a simple example. So in, in this case, our structure will be uh, in this case, the abundance and the diversity. So the community of, of in this case, is a jumping spider, as Altisida. And then, you know that all, all spiders are predators. So this is a, a fairly easy uh, example, but you know, with many, with many organisms, we don't have this clear cut uh, categorization. And actually, this is gonna be uh, an important point of uh, today's presentation, because we will talk about scavenging and, uh, Many predators are also facultative scavenging, although they are often categorized only as, as predators. So let's say that our structure is the diversity of spiders, the, the, the community of spiders, and they, they are all predators. And, and therefore, predation is uh, our, our ecosystem function within the ecosystem that moves uh, nutrients, that moves energy from trophic levels, and so on. Uh, if you think about an agroecosystem, which is a, a particular ecosystem because it's, uh, it's linked to, to human activities. There is a, a, an interest, which is an economic interest. Uh, you know, we want to, to, to produce a crop and uh, we, we want to increase the yield, etc. Um, this predation on a caterpillar, uh, which 
may or may not be a, a pest in the, in, in the crop, but this will be a pest control. This will be a service, you know, that the fact that predators regulate the, the, the abundance density of, uh, of herbivores and avoid them to, to reach past density in the first place, right? So this will be considered a service because it's economically beneficial for people. But, you know, spiders are not really uh, that, uh, um, as a specific uh, with their prey, they, they, they have no problem, for instance, of killing other spiders and, and, and feeding on them. No? So cannibalism is, is uh, fairly common in this guild, in this group, uh, not only on spider, but also with other arthropods. And, and this may be considered a disservice because uh, it will reduce the pool of natural enemies in your crop. And therefore it will, uh, it will be beneficial for the, for the herbivore population because there are less enemies. Um, so you see that the main difference is uh, between this stage and, and the ecosystem service and the services stage is the perspective, uh, the anthropic perspective that from the ecosystem function point of view is uh, completely missing. All right, now um, it's, this is going to be fairly brief, but uh, uh, very important for, for the rationale of the agroecoservice project because um, we have seen from the previous diagram that uh, biodiversity uh, provides uh, is the basis for ecosystem function and, and also for ecosystem services, the service in, in, in specific uh, context. And, uh, and, and people have been interested in this relationship for, for, for ages, I'd almost say, because you know, even, even Darwin studied this, uh, discussed at least this, uh, this relationship. There are some records um in his letters where where he writes about uh, um the english garden and and uh, noting that uh, increasing the the species of, of, of grass uh, increase somehow the stability of the of, of the garden so it's it's an old concept it's not uh, completely new although it was developed mostly around the 70s and and and, and actually the first test uh, uh, happened later in the in the 90s. I'm going to discuss a little bit some of those. Um, I want to show you some conceptual uh, graphs to, to give you an idea what we are talking about. So here on the left, there are several models to discuss this hypothetical relationship between uh, biodiversity biodiversity x generic on the on the horizontal axis and here we have a, a, an ecosystem process y uh, unspecified on the on the vertical axis and and you see that uh, in all these graphs the, the the there is a black point that is uh, is uh, at the same level so just uh, all these models are indicating that uh, uh, at this level of biodiversity you get this level of uh, a particular ecosystem process but we also see that uh, these uh, these models may be completely different from each other right they 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 can uh, reflect completely different situation and, and reality you know because in one case for instance here on the top right we have a linear model where increasing the number of species in the system in the ecosystem increase linearly the number of uh, um, um, the level of the ecosystem function study but the others, you may have a completely different situation where the level is low uh, most of the time. But then when you add to the system a keystone species, uh, it will perform most of the, of the function and uh, it will suddenly uh, increase the level. Um, so this has been debated and uh, you know, I'm going to show you a few experimental evidence that, uh, that support the redundancy model. Um, but I wanted to show you most of this to explain you the complexity of the, of, the, of the topic. I mean, these are only some of the models that have been presented to explain this, uh, this, um, um, this relationship. And it's actually very important nowadays trying to understand what, how this uh, relationship looks like, because um, you, you can also read these graphs uh, backward, you know, and imagining that uh, you remove species from a system, which is essentially what's happening now with, uh, with increasing extinction rates. So you remove species from a system and 
what's going to happen to that system? I mean, uh, where are the tipping points when it will collapse? Because, you know, if the situation is like the model of the Keystone species, you know, you, you remove the wrong species and all of a sudden all the, the, the level of the system process collapse and it becomes very low and, and, and possibly the ecosystem changes to its state to another one, uh, if possible. But, you know, if, for instance, we, we are in a redundancy model, removing species until some point may not um, have visible consequences because uh, we are perhaps we are still on the asymptotic part of the of the curve of the relationship. So this is a, it's really important nowadays. It's not only uh, a theoretical questions anymore. You know, there's practical consequences for conservation biology. Um, but this is also consequences for um, for us when we want to to study ecosystem functions because. Um, we'll see, we'll discuss that uh, because of the relationship with the biodiversity, you know, was always at the beginning expected to be linear or perhaps uh, redundant. Uh, there has been a lot of, uh, uh, of effort of quantification of uh, ecosystem function through indirect measures. Somehow people were focusing on biodiversity to um, discuss uh, potential uh, meaning for, for ecosystem function. We'll, We'll show some example later with the insect to, to make this clear. Um, I mentioned before that uh, there have been some, uh, some tests uh, for, uh, for this relationship. This uh, come uh, mostly from the, the middle of the 90s. There are two groups that in particular have worked on this. One is uh, Tillman's group in, uh, in Cedar Creek um, in, in North America and the USA. And the other is the group of Naim in, uh, in uh, Silver Park in London. And, uh, and both somehow reached the same conclusion that increasing diversity increase um, the service in a, in a, in a um, asot as asymptotic way that is basically look like the redundancy model that I showed before. Um, in case of Naim, they were actually working with, uh, with Mesocosmos. It was a control experiment. They were, they were increasing the complexity at different uh, uh, trophic levels. And, uh, and uh, in both cases, then they were measuring um, some, uh, some function parameters that were usually related to plant diversity, like uh, uh, CO2 or oxygen production or um, um, absorption of, of light. Um, in, in the case of Tillman, they were only working with plants. So normally, these experiments were done on the, you know, on particular ecosystem like prairies. Uh, they were increasing the number of species and, and seeing what's, uh, what was going on. Um, they, you know, they are particular uh, because they were, um, they were, the selection of the species were, was not really natural. I mean, they, they had to, to make a decision and, and pick some of the species that occurs in, in, in prairies, but it was not a natural settings. They also, the scale, uh, both in, in terms of space and time, uh, were particularly small. So, and, and they only measure really ecosystem function that are related to plants. So in the end, uh, translating these results to, to real ecosystems, particularly when you look at uh, ecosystem functions that are provided by insects. It's, it's really difficult. And, uh, and uh, so far, you know, most of the evidence that we have about this relation comes from, uh, from models like this or from mesogom experiment and, and, and mostly from plant study. So it's, uh, it's really uh, difficult to, to, as an entomologist, to understand if this is still holds true for, for insects, for arthropods. And now let's talk a little bit uh, about the agroecoservice project because here is where we tried a novel approach to somehow to solve this, uh, this problem of the biodiversity ecosystem function relationship at the base, like we decide, okay, why not we look directly at the ecosystem functionship and we somehow not forget about biodiversity, but we complement these two information together because they may not provide the same results and, and may actually be interesting to, to, to look at them separately. 
uh, I want to explain you first of all why it's uh, it's a problem because I'm, I already mentioned that uh, I'm, I work with insects here. Paolo works with the arthropods too. And uh, if you if you if you know entomology, if you work with the with insect, you know that uh, uh, they have been traditionally monitored by by collecting them. And uh, on the one hand, this is probably related to to a whole heritage that you know taxonomy of the 1800 where where taxonomies were traveling a lot, especially to tropical place and they were they were collecting species because they wanted to describe species there, there was this century where people uh, were rushing to collect more and more species and send them to europe and people in europe wanted to see incredible things new things and it was a big business and uh, and entomology you know was was part of that and uh, you know it was not unusual at that time even to collect uh, uh, vertebrates by killing them no like you read the memories of, uh, of Wallace traveling in Borneo, and he was shooting orangutan just to 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 bring uh, specimen back to Europe. And uh, it was not one or two. I mean, it, it was a just a normal things to do to sample uh, individuals at the time. There was no uh, concern of conservation. And uh, uh, for instance, some insects somehow this uh, this uh, persist because you know nowadays. You will never shoot uh, an orangutan for for collecting the, the individual the specimen, but uh, because somehow you respect there is a there is an ethics towards the individual and uh, and for instance if you think about it the, the ethics is mostly at the species level. I mean you care about the species, you don't care about the individuals. The individual can be collected. I mean this is a common uh, way of thinking among uh, entomologists. You know because they think that even collecting a few individuals won't harm the population instead for vertebrates it may be a different uh, situation and 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 therefore you know insects have been collected uh, by by several traps i mean here i'm going to sh showing some just as a sample you know these are uh, pan traps you know they they are colorful and attract a different uh, insect and then they fall into a liquid and and die uh, malaise traps where they they remain trapped and then they try to escape uh, they they enter the bottle with a normally a preservative like alcohol or something else and they can be collected these are pitfall traps for for ground active insects they just uh, randomly walk and and fall uh, in, in into a glass that normally is also a preservative liquid and this is probably the most iconic uh, sampling meter for entomologists you know the, the, the butterfly net for for collecting all flying insects so it has always been typical and then you know considered normal routine to to collect insects and uh, and um, somehow identify them and uh, and get information from their densities and uh, and this end up in us having uh, many many monitoring tools for collecting uh, uh, and studying uh, uh, the structure no? the biodiversity the, the taxonom of insects uh, but on the other hand you know we we know from the the discussion we had before about the biodiversity and the system function relationship that this uh, information may not be easy to translate uh, in uh, in terms of uh, ecological function so how much this information tells us is still uh, unclear um, here i'm going to make an example with uh, with pest control but uh, the same can be said about also other services for instance uh, they recently published a, a review uh, about the effect on on flowering strips in agro service and the effect on pollinators and they uh, they notice that you know very often uh, pollinators are also pest pest, uh, pest agents pest control agents like uh, natural enemies they they increase their density uh, thanks to to flowering strips but uh, this does not always translate in enhance uh, ecological function so uh, this this result may understand why it's important and, and also why it's complicated to understand this relationship because we may want to test uh, some some uh, some strategy to to improve the service because at the end of the day we we are interested in the service we say that there is a utilitarian uh, interest an economic interest so we want to to increase the ecological function and 
overall the service. And uh, we do that by attracting biodiversity, but we don't know if this will always be translated to a positive effect. And, uh, and this example is, is really nice in this sense. It's a, it's a paper by Rush et al. Public in, uh, published in uh, Basic and, uh, and Applied Ecology in uh, 2015. And uh, they, they were investigating two, two predatory guilds. Um, here in Gray, we have uh, ground beetles, carabid. And uh, and on black we have uh, we have a spiders and uh, and here on black there was a prey that are is an aphid, and um, they they measure densities like like usual you know, with peaceful traps they were collecting uh, activity density of the of, the, of, of this, uh, these two groups and uh, the densities here on the vertical axis and here on the horizontal one they they took care also to measure the 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 specimen so they had the body sides and here you see in gray the, the the density of the of the ground beetle and in black the density of, of, uh, of the spiders and and here we have another uh panel where we have a predation rate and this this was measured instead directly not not through densities of these two groups but by exposing aphids on on cards and uh, these were live aphids, and then uh, uh, they were essentially checking how many of these aphids were disappearing from the cards. So that's why, in this case, the, this panel is uh, constrained between 0% and, and 100%. Okay, here is in a proportion scale, but it's you know, no, no aphid disappear and all aphids disappear. And the experiment was nice because they, they measured these two things together simultaneously. So they measured the structure and the, and the ecosystem function at the same time. And you see that uh, uh, something that, uh, that looked perhaps a little bit surprising. So we have the first on the context, the first uh, um, scenario on, the, on top where basically there were many uh, spiders, small spiders between uh, zero and five millimeters with very high density. And uh, only a few small ground beetles and, uh, and then also a few big, large uh, ground beetles around uh, 13 millimeters. And predation rate was very high. So it seems that they together in this combination, they were providing a, a, a very good pest control service in, the, in this uh, system, which was actually cereal fields in, uh, in Germany. And then they, they noticed that uh, at some point something changed. Uh, this is the scenario on the, at the bottom. They, they continue sample uh, both biodiversity and measure directly the predation rates. And you see that here the predation rate uh, dropped around 0 0.3, so like 30%. And here there was a change in the density. So the spider's density, the small spider is always more or less at the same level than in the top scenario. But there was a reduction of the, of the small ground beetles and an increase in, the, in big ground beetles. And somehow this may look counterintuitive because you may think that if there are bigger ground beetles, they will, uh, they will predate more, they will be more hungry, they will need more aphids to be succeed and, uh, and for the physiological needs. And this will overall increase the predation rate, instead they decrease it. And that's because, you know, what's gonna happen, it was what, what was happening is that uh, the ground beetles start predating on the spiders as well, on the small spiders. So there was what is called uh, intergill predation. So uh, the, the intergill predation so means that uh, a group of predators, a guild of predators, the one of carabid was predating on another guild of predators, the one uh, of spiders. And this, you know, probably was also present before, but it was not present on the same level than, than it was in this other scenario when the, the density of the large ground beetles increased. So if you only look at the, at the biodiversity, uh, so you know, imagine that we only collected the beetles and, and, and spider, and, and we don't see the right part of this graph, this panel, you may conclude that uh, whatever treatment you have done on, the, on, the, on your cereal field has been uh, effective because you are increasing the number of natural enemies and you assume 
that this will linearly increase pressure rate. But in reality, it's more complicated than that. It depends by the particular traits of the species and the relationship between uh, uh, species in the system. And, uh, you know, this has been pointed by, by, by several authors, you know, and uh, there's been a call somehow for uh, starting to measure ecosystem function directly, you know, not, not to say that it's not important to measure biodiversity, but to say that, you know, these two things are different and they can measure together simultaneously to provide complementary information. And I think one of the first paper doing that was a, was a review by Mayer et al, um, German group, and then they published uh, essentially a set of uh, tools that can be used for a rapid ecosystem function assessment. And uh, uh, they, they, this was a first step in the, in the, in the direction. I mean, they, they, they don't really uh, suggest direct uh, measure, direct tools for, for, for measuring every ecosystem function, you know, for something like pollination, they still suggest to, to collect uh, pollinators, which is indirect, but uh, they do that because they also take into account how difficult it is to, to, to do otherwise and to estimate it directly. And for pollination, it's actually a lot of work. We've done it uh, during the agriculture service project, but they, they anyway give uh, an indication of which tools are available or were available in 2015 when this was published. And, uh, and with Gabor, the, who is present now, um, we, we published also a review. Uh, this was specific for, for the predation uh, as, a, as an ecosystem function. Uh, and we analyzed the use of sentinel prey uh, to quantify predation in different uh, in different uh, field conditions, or like in different habitats, from uh, agro 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 ecosystems to to natural habitats, and these were somehow uh, the first uh, um, review in this in this direction, and uh, they were also well uh, um, received by the community because. Uh, this was not done, but the problem was identified already long ago. Some people were complaining that, uh, you know, that measure were not, um, measure of biodiversity were not precise for ecosystem function. And now I'm going to briefly mention what we've done during the agriculture services, which was actually is a acronym of a, of a, well, not really an acronym, but it stands for assessing existing services, and these services provided by arthropod species in Azorian agroecosystem. But as Paolo mentioned, we also uh, measure this uh, this uh, function in the native forest because we essentially need the baseline. You know, we uh, before people are arrived on Tercer Island, everything was was a native forest. So uh, we assume that the level that we found today in the native forest are the the regional one for these services. And then uh, once people start to, to clear the native forest and to, to modify the environment, they, they also uh, modify the, the biotic community. And uh, ultimately, they also modify the, the levels of the various ecosystem services. And uh, this presentation, I'm going to talk about scavenging, but we, we measure many others. Uh, we measure predation by using the, the sentinel prey meter that I, I mentioned before, um, the one we review with Gabor. This is an artificial caterpillar that is uh, exposed uh, on the ground and then, uh, you know, it's made of plastic and it will be, uh, it might be attacked by predators and then it will be possible to identify the predator by the bite mark on the, on the plastic in surface. Uh, here we have instead the tea bags, which is basically a, um, emulate the organic material. You know, we, we, we put them in the soil and uh, they emulate the decomposition of leaves, because, uh, tea, tea leaves. And, uh, and in this case, we also use the rooibos, which is a little bit more woody, and they can represent the woody component of, uh, of uh, plant material. Um, on top here we have uh, um, phytometers. So these are uh, plants that uh, perhaps not 100%, uh, but they require in large measure the contribution of arthropods for pollination. I mean, this is uh, in this case a strawberry and uh, 
we know that uh, that uh, arthropods increase the the quality and the quantity also the size of the of, of fruits um so we we we, we use strawberries and uh, we expose them uh, are they open you know that can be accessed to uh, pollinators so that they can be pollinated by insects or ex excluding pollinator using a fine mesh and then we we, we, we observe if it was a, a, a benefit of, uh, you know, allowing pollinators in. We also measure seed predation, which is actually uh, perhaps a little bit more complicated as, a, as an ecological function, because uh, in some case, uh, organisms that feed on seeds, they are actually dispersing them, you know, many, especially many uh, vertebrates, large vertebrates, the, the, the larger they are, the better dispersers they are usually, and they don't destroy off always the seed when they, when they chew, sometimes they ingest it and actually then they disperse it by defecating far away from where they eat the fruit or, and, and, and this actually is a beneficial uh, ecological function, but in this case, what we've done was to use um, wheat seeds. They are essentially uh, a crop seeds. So we assume that uh, whenever they were predated and they were consumed, uh, they were uh, basically, we, we were measuring at this service because the farmer, from the farmer perspective, this would be inconvenient. But we also have the same system you know, again, with a Tupperware box, but with the, with the wheat seed, with the taraxagum, we try both taraxagum and, and mustard seeds. And, uh, and uh, in that case, uh, whenever the seed was chewed or disappeared, that was considered a service because it, it would reduce the population of weeds. Um, in, you know, here I, I wanted to make this, uh, this distinction between service and disservice because it was actually possible to, to test that. But if you think about scavenging, that's uh, actually only, only a service, a scavenger or even decomposition, you know, that's, that's ne never negative, you know, it's always an ecosystem function that turns into an ecosystem services. Uh, we also measure herbivory. Uh, we, we did it only on, uh, on a lettuce plant uh, and uh, in that case, that was considered a disservice. So what you realize by, by looking at this, uh, these figures is that what we did was essentially to, to emulate the natural phenomena uh, like uh, predation, decomposition, pollination, seed predation, herbivory. And, uh, and we did that by exposing what we call a sentinel. You know, before I, I mentioned sentinel prey method when referring to the artificial caterpillar, because sentinel prey had been uh, one of, in a sense, one of the first to be used of this to be called that way. But uh, uh, all of them are sentinels. You know, they are sentinel uh, um, item that are exposed in uh, under field condition to to measure a natural phenomenon and then. Uh, we, we, we do that in a standardized way. So compared to, um, for instance, measuring herbivory directly on, on plants in the field, this can be done in a standardized way. So all of this gives you um, an important advantage compared to other systems is that you can, you can make comparison. So neither of them is supposed to give you a, an, an, an idea of what's the real level of that function in the field because you know a, an artificial caterpillar is not a real caterpillar uh, however if you use uh, artificial caterpillar or any of these other methods in uh, in one setting for instance you know one habitat or, or um, a particular treatment in within one habitat you know we've done this in, uh, in an agro ecosystem so we 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 also made the different tests with the uh, different settings, sometimes planting flower in strips and, and etc. So you can you can compare. It gives you some quantitative information that you can compare between treatments. And the, even if they don't reflect uh, uh, completely the, the the real phenomenon in the field, they they provide the quantitative data that are comparable. And this is uh, this is important and this is new. And. Uh, of course, what we wanted to do in this project is to uh, try to develop 
this uh, these methods and this methodology in general for for as many services as possible. Here I mention a few, and the last year, uh, or actually this this year, this field season, we managed to to add uh, a new one to this uh, toolkit, which is the 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 scavenging, and is the one that we are gonna look at, uh, now, and it's actually. Uh, was actually very interesting, you know, also because the scavenging is uh, is rarely uh, studied, uh, and when people study uh, scavenging, they normally focus on vertebrate scavenging. You know, if you think about scavenger, probably in your mind you're thinking about a vulture or jackals or hyena or whatever, some animal that are normally vertebrate uh, and and they are. Uh, iconic, uh, specialized uh, sometimes on uh, on um, on carrion, so they are obligate scavenger. Uh, when we talk about insects, the situation is a little bit uh, different, and I'm going to show you also some uh, recent paper about it. And uh, you know, we were particularly interested in, in focusing on on uh, um, scavenging on insect carrion because. Uh, Insects die for a number of reasons other than predation. You know, they, they die for dehydration, also sometimes partial predation, uh, parasitism, uh, um, uh, can be even an impact with a bake hole. Uh, you know, there are a number of reasons why, uh, why insects die that are unrelated to predation. What happened to all these insects? I mean, uh, how long does it take them to to be to disappear, to be consumed, and by who? You know, we are curious about this. Uh, this and 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 also we wanted to to test uh, uh, these uh, these services in different habitat. And uh, here, you know, the photo is a little bit creepy, but I want to do just to to. To make a point in favor of studying scavenging, you know, because it's a it's an understudy, but uh, I think it deserves much more attention. Because uh, first of all, uh, as I mentioned, the many many animals die for for various reasons. So, carrion is a very abundant resource. You know, it's uh, it's always present. I mean, uh, all the animals die, so it, it's it's uh, it's a, a safe bet to be a scavenger because you will always find something to, to eat at some point. Uh, it is also a very nutrition, uh, nutritious uh, uh, resource because from a stoichiometric point of view, you are not feeding from a lower uh, level on the, on, the, on the web, on the trophic web. You are feeding from, a, a maybe feeding from another predator or, or, or herbivore or something. So you may be more, um, convenient from an energetic point of view. And it's also a riskless activity. So, you know, that's, uh, you know uh, predation is not always as easy as uh, we, we, we picture it. You know, it's not that the predator is always efficient 100%. Uh, uh, actually, unsuccessful predation is, uh, is very common. You know, prey uh, have evolved a, a, a range, an array of methods to First of all, avoiding being detected by predators, but also escape, uh, fight back, uh, and, and you know that is uh, is something that the predators always have to take into account. And uh, if they can get uh, uh, the same prey, but that you know that's uh, that's much convenient because it's without risk. This is uh, uh, something that uh, you know can be said from a, from a, from the perspective of uh, of the arthropod of the species. You know, from uh, for us, we can consider uh, scavenging as an ecosystem service with, with no doubt because it, it uh, avoids that uh, uh, diseases spread because many diseases develop on on corpses, so they they can be uh, controlled by removing. And the carcass, so this is also a service, is also sometimes uh, can, can be considered also a, a, an aesthetic almost uh, service that you are not working in a city and find the dead the, the birds or dead animal. That's also uh, an aspect of it. And uh, from a more, uh, probably more important point of view, from the food web's point of view, it's, uh, it's uh, extremely 
essential way to recycle nutrients and to, to bring them back into the food web. So it's an extremely important ecosystem services and has been neglected. Uh, I wanted to show you this, um, this graph. It comes from a, from a paper by Wilson and uh, Wolkovich in uh, Trends in Ecology and Evolution 2011. They, they, this was an opinion paper. The, the authors were working with uh, basically reviewing uh, the few, uh, few articles that work on, uh, on, uh, on food webs. And they, you know, in this graph, we have on the top the, the percentage uh, scavenging uh, estimate in, uh, in different ecosystems. We have estuary, freshwater, marine, and, and terrestrial in, in uh, different colors. And, uh, and uh, on the bottom one here, we have the total links. Uh, again, estimate, uh, and and uh, here on the horizontal axis we have on the left webs that include potential scavenging links, and on the right the webs that do, did not include uh, scavenging itself. And uh, they realized that uh, most most webs, I mean, but this was most researcher, you know, they always classified or most often classify carnivory as predation. You know, and this may, may also be related to the fact that uh, scavenging has been always considered like a, a, a little bit of a funny behavior, right? And not something like that animals do because they, they do it normally, but because perhaps they are forced to do it or something they don't always do it. And, and uh, there is a tendency to think at animals, you know, as, as, as predators. And this is a problem when, for instance, you, you study food webs with uh, methods like uh, isotope analysis or DNA analysis of the gut content, because whenever you find prey DNA in the gut of your predator, you actually don't know if, uh, if this was consumed it was predation or if it was scavenging, you know, you cannot distinguish between the two. And, uh, and in fact, when they adjust this, uh, these webs, including what they knew to be scavenging leaks, so species that they were known to be at, at least facultative scavengers, they realized that uh, uh, until now, uh, scavenging is underestimated by 16 fold. So an enormous difference, you, you can see it here on the top graph between uh, start, the same studies when they include the link of scavenging on the left and when they do not. So essentially we don't know much about this, uh, this, uh, this function because it hasn't been studied very much. And also because even when people collect data that are potentially useful for understanding more scavenging, they, they keep overlooking it because of some preconception they have about this, uh, this phenomenon. Uh, I, I hope I'm not uh, too slow and I'm still on time. Uh, here, finally, we, we're gonna start talking about the experiment that we, we have done on Terceira to, to measure scavenging, uh, particularly to measure uh, invertebrate scavenging or so scavenging on invertebrate carrion. And, uh, and we wanted to, uh, of course, measure indirectly. So we didn't want to sample uh, species and, and, and estimate it from that. Also because sometimes we don't know who are the scavengers. I mean, so it's, you will see also from the, from the results of this experiment that uh, there are groups that uh, we often don't consider as scavenger. And uh, I, I confess it was also a surprise for, for myself to see some of them uh, on the on the dead prey that we use to to measure scavenging. So <clears throat> what we did, and and for this we 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 thank uh, Gabor and uh, and the Oros University because they they provide us with uh, with the first uh, um, sample with a with a group of of um, a fly uh, or musca domestica. These are the house fly. That's a very common species. And uh, we essentially took this colon in, uh, in our lab and uh, using uh, some, some wood cage, we, 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 we raise it, we rear it. So what we, we wanted was actually not the, the adult. I mean, we, we, we always feed them and, uh, and, and clean them and took care of them, but we want them to collect the larva. And the system was actually pretty handy because uh, 
the 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 flies had this habit of uh, of lay the eggs into the into the medium that is used for feeding them for feeding the larvae so we we just have to prepare uh, in containers small containers some uh, mixture of the the fodder that we use which was based on alfalfa bran uh, water a little bit of yeast and uh, and then we place this into the cage and the, and the larvae uh, sorry and the flies were automatically laying eggs there and uh, actually here you see the this green stuff is actually the the medium the 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 the, the, the food we were providing to the larvae and they were developing there so it was easy to to collect them and if you are interested or you want to repeat this experiment elsewhere which you know will be very uh, very makes me very happy you know i am i will uh, send you all the protocol and uh, and more information about it but essentially we were collecting then uh, the larvae when they were uh, fairly big alpha centimeter almost almost before pupation and then we were freezing them we were freezing them and uh, and keep them in the freezer until uh, until we need them so because we were getting every week uh, a huge number of, uh, uh, of of larvae like thousands and uh, we, we we were particularly interested in compare for habitats uh, because of the agroservice project and it's uh, how it was designed in particular we focus on on vineyards and mixed orchards uh, urban garden and the native forest as a baseline and for each of these four habitats, we, we, we replicated with four sites that were at least uh, 100 meters from each other. They, they were uh, similar in, uh, in characteristic. I mean, the, the site, it's, the habitat itself were in different landscape, but that's because the, 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 this habitat are in different contexts in, on Tercera Island. For instance, the vineyards are always in, um, in, a, in an area of the island, in the north part of the island, where there is a specific microclimate, uh, while the native forest is mostly at the highest elevation because that's where it it's, it's, it's left. You know, elsewhere has been cut, and mi both mixed orchard and urban gardens are embedded almost in uh, in town in the city. So the, the the landscape is different, but we when we replicate it in sites, the site had all same characteristics. So we we've done that only to get. Uh, spatial replication and uh, actually uh, for we, we, we measure scavenging uh, uh, during the day and at night so there was a little difference in the two experimental design because at night uh, the field operation was slower it was more difficult to to move especially in the native forest so uh, at night, we only replicate the sites two times. We didn't have the possibility to to, to our four sites. Um, during the day, we replicate the experiment two times, uh, while at night we replicate it three times to compensate for the for the smaller uh, special replication. And uh, in in both cases, we we use fifteen cards. These are these are cards that were cut by by the the central part of toilet paper which is uh, very cheap easy to get and uh, very resistant it was uh, waterproof so we decided to use this we cut uh, just rectangles of uh, of this this toilet paper and then we glue dead uh, dead larvae by using white glue just one drop of white glue it was uh, applied using a toothpick and then uh, and then we 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 use toothpicks at the two corners of uh, of this rectangle to to place the the card uh, in the field that you don't see the larvae now because they are looking down and uh, we left about one centimeter to allow the the, the various arthropods to to reach the the, the larvae so we had uh, little difference in the again for the day and night assessment um, for the day assessment we exposed these uh, these cards at 8 a.m in the morning and then we check them every two hours until 6 p.m and then for the for for the night assessment we, we we've done uh, something different we start different days 
uh, at 6 p.m. by placing all the cards. Then we check them every two hours until uh, until midnight. And we did that because uh, we have done some pilot experiment. Uh, first, uh, by exposing the, the, the cards for 48 hours and then for, for only one day, 24 hours. And basically, uh, everywhere in all the habitat and in all the cards, we found the 100% scavenger rate. So everything was, was disappeared and it, it was impossible to make a, a comparison because they were all 100%. So we, we realized that this, uh, this phenomenon was actually very fast, faster than the other ecosystem function that we measure, that were often measured uh, for two days, for 48 hours. So in this case, we decided that uh, we needed to, to check the, the cards more regularly. And um, we had to settle down for two hours because we had to move between sites and uh, logistically it was, difficult to do less than that. Um, I'm going to show you some photos of the of the four habitats so that uh, you, you understand what are the difference and also because they are very peculiar, at least on uh, Tercera Island, they, they, some of them look very special. For instance, the vineyard that you see here in the photo, they have nothing to do with the vineyards that you, you, you can see in mainland, even Portugal, but in most countries. I mean, we do have, I, I'm, I'm originally from Sicily, and we do have in some island, uh, one next to Africa uh, called Pantelleria, there are actually um, similar vineyards with the, with the walls. So this is typical for, for islands where basically the farmer tries to, to protect the, the crop from the wind uh, from the sea, uh, especially because this sea wind brings salt and the salt will kill the plant. And uh, this actually happened uh, a lot this year. We, we were very unlucky with the weather and they've been um, spray, uh, salt spray in, uh, in spring and uh, it, it was a bit problematic for, for grape production this year. And uh, so what they normally do is to, to, to put Sorry, Marco, Marco yes. just just to remember that he, I don't know how long you you need more. We no, I think there's only a few slides more. Okay, it, how, how much one, time? How much one, time do you have? Uh, it's one. It's one. It's one. Already, so. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll I'll, I'll speed up. <laughs> um, so this uh, these are all particular orchard, you know, in enclosure, and uh, they they help protecting the plants, but also help for the microclimate. And you see that they basically have a barren soil. You know, you only see the plant and few other weeds that manage to grow, but it's a very simple habitat. In orchards instead were very complex, both because in, in the Zorros we use poly, they, the farmer use uh, polyculture, so they are mixed between species. They're often uh, together with banana, but also because they have an undergrowth and they're three-dimensionally three complex. Uh, urban areas were also fairly simple uh, and, and also very disturbed habitat, especially during the day, because we use uh, gardens around the university and, uh, and uh, so there, was, there were people tramping, there was traffic, uh, light pollution and so on, typical of urban areas. And these are the, the native forests uh, in the Azores. I mean, you, you, if you've been here, you know that it's very particular because the forest is really, really dense. Humidity is extremely high, uh, very muddy on the on the ground, and uh, uh, it's difficult also to move inside. So it's a really particular forest. It's nothing to do with the, the European uh, temperate forest. Here I'm finally going to show you some photo of uh, of the scavenger that we we, we recorded, and uh, in general most of the cards were spotted, and and most of the uh, larvae were predated by ants, uh, different, uh, different species, but in particular, uh, the Lassium, the yellow ants, especially in urban areas, and the uh, Tetramorium, that was uh, found in uh, orchards and vineyards as well. And uh, they were extremely efficient and fast at removing the, the larvae, and um, they basically 
uh, were driving the, the results. But we also found uh, um, other groups like uh, uh, pulmonata, like uh, uh, slugs and snail, uh, they were feeding on the, on the larvae and they were uh, particularly abundant in, uh, in the native forest or in other habitats during the early hours of the day. Then when it started to be hot, they, they were disappearing. Um, we also find isopods that, uh, that for me was a surprise, it was very interesting, but uh, it actually mentioned some paper that they, they are also scavenger. I mean, we know that uh, um, marine isopods are, are scavenger. They, this is not as novelty, but for terrestrial one, there was less, uh, less evidence. And also other groups like uh, the Hermaptera, and uh, we haven't found the Coleoptera, that was a big surprise. And for, for this, uh, you know, this probably was the biggest surprise, we found Columbola uh, going on uh, many, many cards for uh, kind of drinking from, uh, from the, the larva, perhaps pursing it and, and drinking it. I, I'm not sure because it was difficult to observe that. And uh, here I'm gonna um, to show you what we found finally. This graph is for the day uh, scavenging rate on the vertical axis. We have the scavenging rate in percentage, and then horizontal one we have a time of the day between ten and and six because we, we, we every two hours. So it's, this is between eight and ten, ten and twelve, and so on. And uh, in the four panels we have the habitat, and uh, they are arranged by highest uh, scavenging rate. And you see that. Uh, Vineyards have the highest scavenging rate. It was uh, extremely high already after four hours, uh, more than 80% of the cars were attacked. More of the 80% of the larvae were taken away and mostly were taken away by ants. And uh, at the end of the experiment, they almost all gone. And uh, you see that this had an uh, exponential increase, a parabolic increase. And a uh, similar uh, pattern was observed in orchards uh, also uh, and, and, and the urban areas, although the levels were a bit lower than in the orchard. And uh, surprisingly, the lowest scavenging rate were found in native forest and the increase was linear, was not parabolic. Uh, this is the same graph, but for, for the nighttime. And you see that uh, overall the night uh, scavenging rate are higher than during the day. Um, you see here that uh, already at the first check, 75% of the, of the, the larvae were disappeared in the vineyards and then soon after we reach 100%. And interesting here, the urban area where the second um, highest scavenging rate, I mean scavenging rate in the urban areas were the second highest. So, uh, we also reached almost 100 percent and uh, and orchards instead was uh, again higher than the native forest but uh, uh, much much uh, lower than in the in the urban areas and in native forests we had a higher level of uh, of scavenging but we also realized that uh, uh, the peak of activities seems to start around midnight so it's possible that uh, we, we overlook uh, the large part of the activity because we haven't sampled between midnight and, uh, and, uh, and, and 8 a.m. That's where I believe uh, the activity of the native forest scavenger in increase dramatically. Uh, this is uh, just uh, the results of a model. I mean, it's basically summarized the results we've, been, we've seen before so that in vineyards, the scavenging rate was always higher in the two time of the day, uh, while in the urban area it was uh, uh, predicted to be 100% at night, but much lower during the day. And this is where you see the major difference, while in the other habitat you, you don't. You see high levels, but not uh, a, a big difference between night and day. And in the native forest inside, you see, again, a big difference, but in, 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 in this case, the, the scavenging rate at night is much higher than during the day. So to conclude this, uh, this presentation, and sorry if I, if I took my more time than I, I should, uh, we found that uh, scavenging uh, rates are extremely high in, in all habitats, uh, although higher in, uh, in, uh, in vineyards. They are also uh, very fast, uh, incredibly fast. They have this exponential growth. We found that in all habitats, they are higher during the night than during the day. 
we found that uh, uh, scavenger rate in the anthropic habitat, like uh, vineyards, uh, orchards, and, and urban areas are higher than in the native forest. And this may probably depend on the fact that we never observe ants in the native forest. Probably the humidity of the native forest is uh, it's, uh, problematic for ants and they are not active there. So this, this, this group was missing and, and the scavenger rate were much lower for, for this reason. And, uh, and finally, which I think is an important point that uh, uh, we've seen many groups that uh, were originally not thought to be scavenger or, or, or perhaps are facultative scavenger and together with other things they do, they do other function as well. But this indicate that uh, scavenging or this facultative scavenging might be much more common than uh, we originally believed. And uh, it's uh, a reason more why we should uh, investigate this uh, ecosystem uh, service uh, more. And uh, sorry again, with, uh, with this I conclude and <laughs> thank you very much for, for attention and thank you very much for inviting me today. Sorry, Patricia. Thank you, know, it's, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we don't have time for questions, but I think people can ask you straight to you. Um, and uh, of course, again, the, the presentation will be available. I will stop recording and presentation will be available on YouTube channel. So anything uh, you want to say to Marco and questions you, you want to, to ask, you can. Yes. You can also contact me by, by email. I think it was at the beginning of the presentation if you have any question or if you want to repeat the experiment and you want uh, the recipe for um, growing the, the, the fly uh, larva and replicated experiment, uh, you're very welcome. And we, we can provide assistance for that. I only want to, to thank you, Marco, and to say that uh, these kind of experiments are quite time consuming in the lab and in the field. Oh, yes. uh, the, the direct quantification of uh, most of people do indirect quantifications of ecosystem service using GIS and other indirect. Uh, but with this very direct uh, quantification, of course, the results are fantastic, but is very time consuming in preparing in the lab, in the field, but which is quite challenging. But the results, as you can see, are quite uh, uh, interesting. And we should, in the future, try uh, the students and the researchers in general, try to push to do these direct quantifications. Many, time, uh, ma many, many thanks, Marco, for this. And uh, hopefully, we will have uh, other presentations in next months to the showing the results of the other ecosystem services we measure here in the Azores. Thank you again. Thank you and see you next See you. Thank you. Hola, Gabor. Are you okay? Fine. And um, no, yes, yes, many yes. no, and Mario, okay. many knowing uh, Elisa, many, many people here interested in insects and ecosystem service. My big hug for everyone. Okay. Okay, take care. Bye-bye, <laughs> everyone. Thank bye. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, guys.